Does your organisation need more nurses? Struggling to connect with RNs where they spend time? Budgets are tight. There's a scarcity of applicants and using travellers can cost up to an additional $150,000 per year. It's time for a superior solution. It's time to work with the experts. Like us. Since 2019, healthcare providers throughout the US and Canada have successfully engaged and recruited thousands of candidates using nurse recruitment experts' three-step advertising, screening and consultative process. We help healthcare providers reach further with their advertising, discover hidden gems and mobilise the power of their employer brand in nurse recruitment. With results-based pricing and no long-term commitments, we are the most cost-effective and low-risk partner for your nurse recruitment needs. So why not take your nurse recruitment to the experts? Visit nurserecruitmentx.com. Hello, everybody. Welcome along to another Nurse Recruitment Experts webinar in our Nurse Recruitment Secrets series. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Ange Cruz, who is our new Director of Marketing. So Ange has a really strong background in healthcare marketing. And particularly, she recently led a digital transformation for Praxis Care, an international charity serving 1,400 people with intellectual developmental disabilities. And she really caught our eye because she achieved some stunning results for Praxis Care over three years, including growing their YouTube subscribers by 5,000%, Instagram followers by 300%, and Facebook followers by 600%. And the reason I wanted to talk about this topic today is because there's a lot of potential job candidates out there on social media, particularly nurses. And there's a real opportunity here for healthcare providers, healthcare employers to reach new untapped groups of candidates through creating great content and really having a strong social media strategy and presence. So, Ansh, before we get started, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Absolutely. Thanks, boss. So I have 14 years of experience in marketing and I kicked off my career at a digital marketing agency in Toronto. Um, and then since then, I've done work for companies and nonprofits based in the US, UK, Ireland, Isle of Man and China. Um, so getting, getting around. And uh, most relevant, as you mentioned, so Praxis Care was my most recent role before I started here at Nurse Recruitment Experts, um, where I was the head of marketing. And also before that, um, from 2016 to 2019, I was the marketing director at ELG, which is a social enterprise that provides pediatric therapy and special education services. Um, so very similar kind of health and social uh, sector kind of work. And when I was at ELG, we had an eightfold um, increase in our social media follower count, which is still amazing to me because we've never, we kind of set out with KPIs in mind that were way lower than what we ended up achieving at both organizations. So I'm excited to share a bit about how we did that. Yeah, that's awesome. And ELG is there and based in China as well. So that's probably a new kind of cross-cultural thing that you had to do as well. Yeah, so in, for the audience within China and also for our recruitment, because um, in China, at least at that time, a lot of universities didn't have the degrees um, available for the different pediatric therapies. So we needed to recruit from overseas. So we had to keep um, international audiences in mind a lot with our social media content. And we found a lot of recruits were checking our social media accounts, even if they saw our jobs posted elsewhere, making yeah. sure that we had yeah that presence in those audiences was key. Okay, well, let's jump into it because you're right. A lot of nurses and um, recruits for every position really want to check out the employer on social media, but there's a dizzying array of options for employers to post on. Facebook, Instagram, TikTok are the major ones, but you've also got, uh, I could go on forever, uh, sites come and don't go. So the first question would be what social media accounts do healthcare organizations really need? So I'm not going to answer that so directly because it depends where you're working, who your audience is. Um, for us, the example of Praxis Care, um, having, of course, if you're recruiting LinkedIn is, you should be on LinkedIn. Um, but a lot of what you need to be thinking about for where you're, you're registering your accounts 
would be um, obviously where your audience is going to be, but also don't worry so much about making sure you do a perfect job of running those accounts. So for example, at Praxis Care, we had a TikTok account for a year that we didn't post on, but we just made sure that that username was protected in case we wanted to post on it. And for other organizations, I would recommend things like, you know, even if you don't have the capacity on your team, a lot of organizations are really stretched. Just make sure that you have the page, say, on Facebook, because if people are looking for your hours, if they're looking for your contact details, make it easy on them so you've got pages in the places where they might be looking for you. So wherever you can think of that somebody might be looking for you, at least get your logo there, get your contact details, your website, your hours, if that's important, up there so that you can save people a bit of hassle. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we should double check after this that we've got all our all our pages <laughs> covered for this. I think we did. And I think you've also spoke before to me about having too many accounts and sub brands and uh, yeah. everything that, dispersed. Yeah. That can get really messy. So unless you're very confident in your team's capacity to be able to manage multiple accounts and that the people managing the accounts, either it's the same person managing the accounts or that the people who are managing the different kind of sub brands of your organization um, are communicating with each other. So you're not diluting your brand or making it confusing for people. I've definitely, um, yeah, I've worked places before where we had to combine accounts and it can be really messy and really tricky and you don't want to lose your audience or dilute your audience spreading them out too thin. So mm -hmm. definitely be strategic about how many accounts you can realistically manage to actually be posting on. Yeah. I mean, just for us, getting clients was all LinkedIn, as you could mm -hmm. expect, because 98% of recruiters are on LinkedIn and we're trying to sell to recruitment teams. So it made sense for us really just to do all of our client facing marketing on LinkedIn for, for quite a long time. So that kind of resonates with us that investing in a platform doesn't have to be every platform, but one that your audience are on and gets results. Totally. When it comes to what you put on that platform, could you tell us a little bit more about the type of content that healthcare providers should be posting, particularly if you can on how to recruit people? Yeah. Well, for it probably doesn't need to be said, but I'll say it anyway. Making sure that confidentiality, respect, and empathy are in your mind with everything that you post um, is really important, especially health and social services. Like you don't want to be um, the, the way that you get consent from people to be featured in your content is by continually making sure that you're presenting people in a dignified, respectful way um, where you're not breaking confidentiality, of course. So that's out of the way. <laughs> um, what I would really say if your goal is recruitment, which we had both at ELG and Praxis Care, um, making sure that you're sharing content that shows what it's like to work somewhere. This sounds really obvious, but honestly, it's not necessarily what a lot of healthcare providers are doing. So I remember being at ELG and we had a speech language pathologist who had moved from I think, New Zealand to China to work for us. And one of the things that she'd mentioned to me was that she'd looked at our Facebook and on our Facebook page, it took like no time at all. We just posted an album of one of our staff parties and it just looked like such a good time that it yeah. made her feel really good about taking that leap. Because I, I mean, a lot of the recruitment we do as well at Nurse Recruitment Experts, people are moving, like relocating their whole lives, their families to go work somewhere or having big commutes. Like you don't want to have a big life change if you're not really sure what it's going to look like. So it wasn't even a fancy post. It was something we did really quickly, kind of a throwaway that made the difference for a massive recruitment win um, mm. in, in that situation. And yeah. something to keep in mind with, with content, like work with what you've got. So in my ELG and Praxis being my main examples, the setup for staff was so different. So at ELG, specialists uh, primarily were paid based on their appointments that they had, the scheduling, et cetera. So they had a lot more incentive to have kind of a personal brand and try to get clients to come to them specifically. So we had a lot of like really enthusiastic cooperation in creating useful content um, based on their expertise. So different specialists, um, different medical professionals, specialists would come up with um, you know articles about what to do if you notice this in your child or what are red flags for different things? Really easy to get that content from them. 
versus practice care where you have a lot more staff who have kind of these intense work days where they are doing more of kind of shift work and staff it doesn't really matter how many people we recruit necessarily they just have a job and they're doing that job every day so it's a bit harder to get that kind of sit down lay out an article mm -hmm. record a video kind of content but we had you know 14 1500 people we support a lot of them were supporting every day or five days a week where they're doing really cool stuff every day and so it was easy for staff to take pictures or take videos of that kind of thing going on so most of the content there was less about giving people tips and more just about showing what it's like every day at the different praxis care sites and both worked fine. And what I worry about with some health organizations when you're planning your marketing is trying to kind of come up with the ideas without thinking about where you're going to get it from and how practical it actually is to source that content. For mm. Yeah, that's a major barrier for a lot of our clients, I think, getting well, they have to get marketing teams buy in to take photos or come up with instructions for nurses or other staff to take photos. And we haven't really seen that kind of user generated content come out a lot. Why do you think that is? And do you think it's feasible in a, say, a thousand people organization to get those nurses to be creating content for the marketing? I think so. I mean, we did it at Praxis. It was a, a learning curve. It took a while. What really helped us um, within Praxis is we had an intranet where people could share images. So that's how we got a lot of our content as the marketing department is obviously they checked consent, got all the forms signed, et cetera, before they did this. But then they would just share content within our intranet. They had that capacity so other people in the organization could get ideas so it had a, a, mul a multiplying effect. So other people in the organization could see what other people were doing, get ideas, kind of share suggestions with each other. And then as a department, we could just steal <laughs> all the content that we yeah. knew had consent um, and, and get with usually, you know, a caption backstory, whatever that we could use to, to fill that in. So I think it's definitely doable if people get in the habit. And in our case, it was a lot easier because we had that public place where people could see other people were doing it. Where before that, it was just, we were relying on people emailing us pictures or videos and things. And it was a lot more done in, you know, individual one-to-one -one scenarios where other people couldn't really see what was going on. It made it a lot harder mm -hmm. to encourage people to share. So as much as people can have sort of public repositories of information, that definitely helps. I love, love that you're making them feel more encouraged to share because they're seeing other people's content come in. Yeah, it was really, really cool. We weren't really sure if it was going to work, but it worked better than we, we expected. Yeah. So I think we touched upon the cross-cultural thing, but trans creation is a word that we've seen come up and I don't think it's a very well used word. I've never heard anyone actually say this word <laughs> outside of these couple of government clients that we've been working with. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? What is trans creation and why is it important? I'm so excited this term now exists or now I'm aware of it because we didn't, it was so clunky before trying to explain um, what we did, uh, especially in China, um, working particularly with disabilities. It, it can be so dicey in healthcare and disability care when you're talking about translating terminology. Mm -hmm. um, various places I've worked that were in multiple languages had really just translation or la la lazy translation where old materials we would find with people that were native speakers of that language or people that were aware had lived experience in that sector would notice you know very outdated often offensive terminology would be what you know your google translate or a lazy translator would come up with um, so cr trans creation is wonderful because you're translating not just the words but really the intent and the meaning and the feeling behind everything so it's great at, at nurse recruitment experts that we have you know kevin on staff doing that for us and it's yeah the main thing when you're talking about multilingual material is making sure that somebody who understands the language and the subject matter is in charge of translating material because just having the language skills is not enough to do a good job and yeah make sure that you're you're actually translating transcreating mm. the content okay because i'm i speak spanish and i've realized that there's some things that we don't have a direct translation of either way. Mm -hmm. And language is 
very interlinked with culture. So it's hard to separate the two, I find, and certainly some of the translations that you do see, especially I think when I, I was in China for a couple of months, it's like extremely literal and sometimes it just doesn't work. So but how did you go about navigating that as a team? Let's say, let's say there's a home care agency in California and they want to communicate to Spanish speakers. What would they need to do to transcreate some of their content into Spanish? Yeah, for me, I would say finding somebody that has, when you're interviewing, it's not just, you know, the amount of years of translation experience is way less important than the depth of the understanding of the sector and being bilingual and understanding. They need to understand both languages very, very well. Uh, and making sure the work is checked, especially initially when you have somebody doing translation. So I was really lucky that I had a, a really good friend that I worked with for years in China who is... Um, extremely bilingual and really had a had good understanding of the sector. So she was able to check content for me if I had different people translating and she could give yeah, you know, feedback and assess if it was actually good or not. Um, yeah, you really, it can't be something quick. You need to take, have some time, especially initially trying to find the right people to do that mm -hmm. work for you. you. You have to take the time. And we have used platforms like Upwork or Fiverr so listeners look that up, up U P W O R K. If you can't hire someone in house to do this, there's platforms out there to get freelancers. And I would say about multilingual content, um, don't get into the trap of just duplicating everything because it's not necessary. And on the other end, sometimes, you know, in the second language of your organization, say there might be content that makes more sense for that audience that the audience speaking the other language doesn't care about. So getting to know, and this is all over time, everything about content and social media, the algorithms change all the time, what content works changes all the time, and your learning is gonna just develop over time. So just try things if you, you know, maybe duplicate everything initially and then see which content is working in which language. Um, but yeah, don't get caught up in doing everything bilingual if there's content that doesn't, doesn't work with that yeah. particular audience. Okay, thank you for that one. We also want to know the terms of your career. So our kind of audience listening to this is going to be marketing teams and healthcare employers or recruitment teams that are trying to figure out how can they either help each other or do this themselves because it is such a massive opportunity. The the I think it's like eighty percent of adults would go on Facebook or Instagram per day Yikes. in the US. Yeah, so how can how can people tap into that in terms of tips or things that you that you've learned or you wish you knew when you got started? Yeah, I would say that one of the top tips is to share your accounts with your staff. This sounds ridiculous, but it really has made a difference um, in everywhere I've worked really. So what I would do is if you join a new social media platform, whatever your way of communicating with your staff is, newsletter, intranet, email, whatever it is, send it out to everybody, send the link to everybody, just let them know. It gets not mandatory, but you'll get a few people, especially larger organizations. You're gonna get a bunch of people that are interested um, in, in keeping an eye on things. And then whenever you launch a new one, make sure you've got all the other links there as well and remind people because having those links in your email signature is not enough. I had colleagues who'd worked for Praxis for decades who'd been copying different signatures over the years as they changed, which mm -hmm. all had the links to social media, contact me to ask for social media links before in an email with the links in the signature. So don't assume that people are actually going to pay attention to those things or the links on your website just explicitly once or twice a year as well. Just send it out to your staff to say, just in case you're interested, this is where we are. Um, and it really makes a difference because then they join and then they can tell, you know, depending on the organization, but clients, people they support, having them follow as well because they're following, oh, did you see this, you know, mm -hmm. this post or would you want to be featured? And then they can check it out themselves. So that's uh, one easy tip to increasing your audience. 
Um, another thing we found works really well is branding posts. So at Praxis, we did some testing on this and we found that posts that had the Praxis Care logo performed better than those that didn't. So yep. we created templates in Canva and for nonprofit organizations, Canva is free. So definitely look into that if you don't um, already have uh, editing software or if you um, yeah, are interested in something really easy to use and you're worried about budget as well. Um, so we just had really simple templates that had our logos built in. We had some stylized with our branding. There are lots of different colored circles and certain colors. We had those kind of set up so that when you look at a post, especially on Instagram, you could see that it was from us without even having to read much at all. Um, and I think people were more willing to share. People were more willing to stop scrolling when they noticed that, oh, it's from, you know, these guys. So mm -hmm. whatever it is, if it's your logo, if it's the colors, if it's even just the way you edit pictures, you probably notice like, when you're looking at social media, you see like different brands, you can tell it's them even without yeah. reading the name. So as much as you can style yourself and, and make yourselves distinct, it's it's definitely worthwhile. Um, tagging people, I'm sorry, this is getting into a list, but <laughs> mm -hmm. so tagging people, collaborating with people, you can get that kind of influencer effect without paying for an influencer. But you know, if some, politician comes to visit you or you're partnering, you know, a certain organization is bringing in, you know, therapy dogs or something, just make sure yeah. you tag, make sure other organizations when you work with them, know your social media handles so they can tag you as well. A lot of how you're going to reach new audiences is through that kind of sharing with other organizations who are trying to build their audiences as well. So don't be shy about tagging people, collaborating with people. Um, everybody benefits when you yeah. do that. Yeah, I love that. I, I've done that a few times, and even tagging you, yeah, exposed to your audience, for example. So <laughs> tagging those staff members and works for us as well. Um, oh, yeah, and my, I have a secret weapon that I was gonna. <laughs> okay, yeah. to share. Yeah. So my interns are my my secret, my not so secret secret. So the way that I found this job at Nurse Recruitment Experts actually was through a former intern of mine, Eleanor who got some great experience working at Praxis Care um, and did great work for us as well. That was that really, really helped. So if you can get interns in, even if it's just once a year, what we did in the summer, every summer, because the algorithms are always changing, the type of content that works changes depending on what people kind of expect, you know, culture changes, so many things change and it can be really hard to keep up. But if you've got somebody even for a month or two in the summer that can go through, they're often, you know, young people or digital natives, they can go through your analytics, they can go through the posts and see what's working, make suggestions based on research they can do online and using different tools that they can find. And I've just found every single summer getting students to come mm -hmm. kind of take a look at how the organic social media is going and what's working and what's not just made such a difference. And that's how that's really the secret to how we built up all those audiences over oh, those years. Okay. I had like, you know, three summers of, of people to tell me what, what worked and what didn't. Because during the year, like so many teams are just so stretched. You're just trying to get the con get the content, get the content out. You know, maybe yeah. once a month we do like a quick review of like what seemed to work, what didn't work, but having a person dedicated where it's to their benefit and then to your benefit as well is just amazing. Okay. And how do you find them? Is it job posts, job boards, or how did you find the interns? Uh, when we were uh, at Praxis Care, we just connected the universities directly. So the marketing master's programs were mm. helpful for us. Um, and I know in yeah, North America, there's loads of different programs. So when I was in China, there were students that came over from the States uh, to do internships out there. So it, yeah, I would, yeah, just start searching around, ask around for, for Praxis particularly, it was great because um, the universities had funding from different corporations to fund the internships. So the interns were getting paid and we didn't have to pay at least the mm. whole thing. So. It's yes, I was going to ask about that next. So the university paid part of them. So the action for listeners, I suppose, would be to look at your local university, see if they have any programs like that or reach out to them to, to inquire. You also have another secret weapon, which isn't so secret anymore, but ChatGPT. I was wondering if you can tell people a little bit more about that and then I'm going to share my screen because I'm, I know that we're really familiar with this, but 
some of our listeners might not be or, or our viewers. So, Angie, do you just want to talk what is ChatGPT? Sure. So, ChatGPT is artificial intelligence, and you need to remember that it is artificially <laughs> being intelligent. So, it can give you such great advice. It can help you be much more efficient when you're writing your captions, coming up with ideas, but it also can lie to you. So you, you put in prompts, you put in prompts, and then it generates um, text responses. It can do photos. It can do cr can create files. Now it's getting more and more powerful every day. I'm sure this video would be outdated by you know next yeah. week with whatever new features are coming out. But it, it can make lots of stuff for you. But don't worry, I don't think it's coming for our jobs anytime soon. <laughs> That's well, let's put in a prompt here for let's see, help me recruit. I'm going to put in a prompt here. Help me recruit yeah. LPNs in Austin, Texas for a home care agency. So as you can see, you insert the prompt, the words, and then it will give suggestions. So as Alan said, you do have to bear in mind it's not a real person and it's not infallible. But we at Nurse Grim Experts and a lot of our partners use it extremely heavily to understand their market or to generate content. Even just reviewing things to get feedback on it, I found it was very powerful for that. Yeah, and you can ask it to write in different tones. So if you have, if you know what you want to say, but you're, you know, you're running out of time, but you need it to be more in the style of your organization, you can throw mm -hmm. it in there and say, you know, write this in a more friendly tone or warmer, um, or consolidate. You know, you know, it's a bit too wordy. Like, can you take this and then just make it a bit shorter, and it'll come up with different suggestions for you. Yeah. Um, it can also do a good job of if you're working on a computer, it can be annoying to get emojis into your copy if you want if that's your style and it can quickly add it if you just you know say jazz this oh. up with some emojis it can throw in the, the relevant logical emojis for you um, and make things a bit more efficient i would definitely i regret personally i was um nervous about trying it for a while and uh, i regret not giving it a go sooner like you can use it for free and and get a lot of support um yeah for for ideas and writing you know for we would spend uh, again, at Praxis, we could have these brainstorming meetings for ideas for different content. And um, we would go into ChatGPT and then ask it for the same kind of thing. And it would come up with basically the exact same list that our team had spent an hour or two working on in a meeting. So it, it started to save us a lot of time with coming up with, with different ideas for how to creatively approach, you know, it's International Women's Day. This is our organization. What are some ideas you have for, for content that we could make for that, for example? And then you evaluate it as a group. Um, but yeah, definitely. Again, if, if it's drafting content for you, just check it because it can make up numbers. It can make up people. It, yeah. it, it will yeah. quote people that do not exist saying things that are not accurate. <laughs> so just <laughs> be, be careful, use it wisely, but use it for sure. And let's do one more. Let's do Canva before we go. So I'll pull up Canva. I think this is a little bit lesser known with recruitment teams. I mean, their marketing department would probably handle a lot of this, but if we're trying to encourage recruitment teams to think like marketers and get more involved in this, it's useful to understand the tools that are out there. Could you tell us more about Canva? Yeah, so for Canva, you definitely want the pro version. And if you're a nonprofit, you can get it for free and other categories as well. So look into it. If budget's an issue, um, it shouldn't matter with Canva. So Canva is so clever and it's getting better at every day and it's also incorporating different ai things you can see there on the screen there's an ai image generator so mm. it's still not great but you can put in prompts and, and see what it comes up with um, i find the actual photos available in the element section they have stock photography that you can use a lot of the time that's better than what the ai generator is going to come up with but both of the options are there my favorite thing about it though is the brand section so um, within the brand section, if you have the pro version, you can put in your own brand kit. So you put in your logos, you put in your brand colors, you put in your fonts, and then it makes it a lot easier, especially if you're sharing um, with other accounts and people who maybe aren't marketing people, um, they're not gonna be picking 
the wrong colors when they're doing a design. So they can go into a design and those brand colors and fonts and logos will be available really easily for them to use um, and make sure that everything stays on brand just so easily. It's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here we've got our brand font and then I can put in colors here. So definitely worth checking this one out as well. If you're at an organize a small organization, say it's just you, in HR and you have to do recruiting and posting jobs, then this would be a great tool for you to use. And even if you've got a marketing team handling it, you can play about and see the magic behind the marketing and figure out what's possible and what isn't possible. If you have an idea, you can make kind of like a concept of it here and then share it with them. So that's kind of a Thank you very much, Ange. We're coming to the end of the, the session. Do you have any parting words for a marketer or a recruiter in the healthcare organization trying to boost their followers organically? Uh, take your time. It's okay. Not everything is going to work. Try to come up with a consistent posting schedule. Don't panic when you Google how often should you post mm -hmm. and almost every post is going to say, multiple times a day on every platform like that is not achievable for a lot of organizations we didn't do it at the places where i worked where we had really great social media engagement do what you can do it consistently and just keep learning as you go and don't panic if something just doesn't get a response yeah. it's fine try another day <laughs> <laughs> try another day I like that um thanks for coming and i know it is hard if you spend like an hour making stuff and then nobody engages with it but I think that's a really good uh, thing for everyone to keep in mind. So if you want to keep up with the Nurse Recruitment Experts webinars, you can follow us on LinkedIn, Nurse Recruitment Experts. And feel free to leave a comment on YouTube or LinkedIn if you'd like to learn more about us, uh, particularly how we can help you with your recruitment marketing, particularly on hiring nurses. And I want to say thank you again to Ange, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you. Bye.